Bhavana means development of mind. But there is another definition. Development of behavior, which is accepted now by the Pali scholars. They look at it and they say, you can say Bhavana in terms of development of the mind and the mind changes, therefore the behavior of the person begins to change. So development of mind or development of behavior, how we want to look at it. So I'm going to take, um, I'm going to start by looking at this one document that I put up. And originally when I did this, I did it in two parts. And, um, and the reason was because, uh, if it's not in here, I'll tell you very quickly, but when I was in Sri Lanka, I met two very old monks, you know, who in the 80s, one was almost 90, who had been, they had been teachers in the forest, teaching both men or women who wanted to come into the forest, you know, to learn to train in meditation, a very traditional way. And my question about it, one of the discussions was about forgiveness. My question was, did anybody do that? And when they were training people coming into the forest, did they train them about forgiveness? And, and the answer I got about that one was that they have to practice forgiveness for the first week or two that they're there, that he, he would not start teaching these people. He would only teach them how to sit and very basic breathing. That's all. He wouldn't train them or advise them or anything until they had lived there for about two weeks in the forest, learning just basics about living with other people in a group and um, practicing generosity and learning the basic parts of Sheila asking questions about how they had lived as a lay person and then saying, okay, um, you have to practice your Sheila all the time here in the camp with these other people now all of a sudden you're not living in a house you're living with these other people and actually then the question was um concerning uh bhavana and he says the first bhavana is the practice of the shila and the generosity and to activate that, to practice it all the time with people inside. And if you had come from a large family or you had come, sometimes large families have more cooperation inside the, the family than four or five people, eight or 11 people have more cooperation just to get everything done. Sometimes it's messy, <laughs> but by practicing this as the first bhavana and so bhavana means development of mind but development of behavior and can you start living the precepts in front of me in the camp so i can see how you're working people so i was very interested in hearing this from him because that's the way um it we were treated in in the beginning training with bonte on the mount in missouri was to be kind with each other, work well together. Any arguments or disputes had to be worked out very quickly and very kindly and that sort of thing. And, and learning how to do this with people that you hadn't been around before. And, you know, you run into somebody who assumes everything has to be done for them and they can't pick up a bucket or a hammer, <laughs> you know, and then you run into other people who want to pick up the hammer, the, the hammer, but doesn't know anything about using the hammer. <laughs> it's get a very, very interesting thing that happened once with that. But um, the whole thing is this practice. It's, it's a kind of basic practice. So let's go through this and see what we find. Before he was enlightened, when he was still a bodhisattva, the Buddhist first, first tried to rest his attention on one object of meditation until all peripheral vision disappeared. It was the meditation of that day that was what was attempted before he was awakened. It is suspected that this approach did not bring the Buddha to his final goal and reduce day-to-day -day suffering for the people. So what's good is the Buddha figured out how to impersonally witness very deeply 
refined observation levels eventually. Following his awakening, when he decided to teach, he refined what he had learned with his two teachers, meaning um, Ramaputta and um, the first one. And for teaching, he wanted to, he refined what he had learned in, in, into a system for teaching others to do the same investigation he was teaching. And this is, gets interesting because you wonder what did the Buddha teach when he was teaching? And then you have to back up and say, who was he? Where did he live? Who were his teachers? How did he grow up? What did he learn to do? What did he have to teach? And it's all kind of irrelevant in the end because when he comes through, he makes a decision to teach his own way of investigating. This was the source of his teaching. The materials are preserved in the suttas. That's why we go directly to the suttas because they really worked hard to preserve these suttas after he was gone because it had exactly what happened to him, his whole story, just everything was there. So this was the source of his teaching materials preserved in the suttas. Not much of any instruction is left of the texts concerning solutions for problems everybody faces in life today. This is because he systematized the teaching to give instructions for 45 years in one same subject. So you could compare him to a Waldorf school teacher who starts with a class and kindergarten and keeps the same class and teaches them through 12th grade. That's how it's done in Waldorf schools. You have the same teacher, basic teacher, your home teacher remains the same for 12 years. It's like having another parent. Well, this is like what happened with him. Imagine a person teaching the same subject in school for 45 years is bound to refine the way that they're teaching that subject and try and make it simpler for more and more people to be able to pick it up and follow it very closely. It's very interesting in this. You know, was the complete freedom from suffering only true for the arahat attainment? This is something people used to ask a lot. It is true that the total remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering comes only to the arahat with fruition level. That's remainderless. There's nothing left, nothing remaining. It all is fading away and cessation of suffering, cessation of suffering, and then it all fades away, and he comes back with like a brain that he keeps it operating like that, and it's living, now you can say, it's living moment to moment to moment to moment, now you can. It's hard for us to deal with this moment, you know, live in the present moment, but the arahat can live in the present moment like that, okay? The other attainments, it's still, it's different. It is true that the total remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering comes only to the arahat with fruition level. But in the Buddha Dhamma, although there is the ultimate final objective, the super mundane Nibbana, the, the most learning and change comes to the person as they experience the path, the journey with gradual and uh, changes and progress happening along the way. Now, in my travels, I, I used to come up with this question. Anytime I had was around someone who was a historian, I've asked the question many times, and historians agree that in the time of the Buddha, uh, Buddha's teaching, about 4% of the population became monastics in India. It was really big. That's the time when it was really big. And about 1% of that 4% became the meditators pursuing the final goal to arahatship within that monastic structure. So not everybody was just totally there and dedicated to just that. There was a lot more going on, just like there is for nuns or monks today in any religion. There are monks who, you know, I know the, the, the Thai monks, a lot of them come in, they want to work on their meditation, but they were 
they were professional IT professionals are going to come to work and get a place in a temple and working and setting up a printing shop to print all the material for that temple. And when I crossed the United States, every Thai temple had the temple and this much space and the Buddha here and back here through the door was the print shop. It was amazing designing the books and the printed, the flyers and just everything. They were so industrious. So it wasn't long before I figured out that something else was going on of great value for the lay people, though, practicing in communities. And it was not due just to merit or rituals or chanting either. The monastic system had been maintained within Buddhist countries across over 2,600 years. And then there was all this vast part within the structure of the monastic structure. So another question is, so what was so significant in value from the teaching of the lay people um, to take the time to learn some of it? What, what did they get out of it? And the, the answer is the Buddha taught the lay person a primary practice, easy to understand, immediately effective, something that invited deeper inspection, something that would be untouched by time. We know that he left them something without holding back any secrets. He made sure he mentioned this in the Paranibbana Sutta when he's leaving, you know, that I gave you everything. There are no secret teachings. We know that he, um, uh, it was something that they could use in daily life to lessen their suffering. And it is clear that this form of gradual training was taught for the common man, woman, and child. And interestingly enough, what he found could be used by any human being on earth to help them calm down and be happier in life. It actually was a humanistic teaching to relieve suffering for all mankind. Um, in conversations, I've often said, you know, the Buddha was not teaching Buddhists. A lot of the people who were listening were the people who were following him, investigating this teacher, but he was not saying, okay, only Buddhists come in the building. Uh-uh, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It was actually a humanistic teaching to relieve suffering for all mankind. Because of the results of this practice, the kings in different kingdoms around where that area was, the kings did not ignore it. They found his teachings refreshing, clear, and priceless, so much so that they, they decided to greatly support the Sangha and preserve that for posterity, they supplied the four requisites, which were the shelter and the food and the medicine and the clothing for the monastic community in hopes that these monastics would then dedicate themselves to persistent practice, preservation and teaching of this Dhamma for future generations so that it would not be lost. The practice became greatly valued by governments who began to oversee people through more compassionate ways for that time. Certain things sort of slowed down, maybe things like boiling people in oil and <laughs> I don't know, a few other things that they were doing. Okay, thousands found relief through this knowledge as people began understanding the causes of suffering more they in the government, military operations, and community order were all affected. They retained themselves in manifest, uh, to, to retrain, retrained themselves to manifest a better future world by changing their perspectives, and that changed their reactions. So the bhavana produces the mental, the mental uh, practice is pu creating a purification of mind. And this purification is moving the person over to the wholesome actions in line with the precepts and everything comes out better. It took the practice into the daily life, became more at peace and lived happier, richer lives. It is this bhavana that makes Buddhism come to full fruition because it could be used all the time in life, whatever it was that was taught. And I said, ultimately, Buddhism is about change. 
Students must have courage to truly be willing to change for progress through this teaching, for this teaching, uh, for progress through the teaching to happen. The meditation practice offers a special instrument for observation and it acts as a vehicle to carry us to where we can see how things actually operate within our experience in this existence. It alters our perspective, our view of life. And this is the way we look at our experiences as are happening. And the new perspective purifies and retrains the mind systematically along the way. So we're in keeping now when we look at this was written originally back in 2007, I think. And when you, when you look at this whole thing now and we look at it, we say, wow, you know, if the, the students that take this and they keep using it all the time, injecting it into their profession, injecting it into their life, their driving, their, their friends, interactions, everything, it really starts to bloom. And it took years to watch how that can actually work. So with a purer mind, having more knowledge, a meditator learns ways to gain more control over their life. But this is done without force. This is another thing. It is done without force. This is done by allowing it to naturally happen, going back to nature with this. You gain more control whenever you understand how things work or don't work. You cannot fix something if you don't know how it works. You're flying blind with no hope of repair. Because of this, it seems that the Buddha brought hope to a lot of people. And the Buddha devised a gradual system which taught people the skills they need to attain knowledge and vision that matures into knowledge and wisdom. Again, what do we mean by knowledge and vision? We mean not getting lost in analyzing uh, everything and thinking and thinking and rethinking how this works and everything, but practicing in following a set of instructions and trusting that we will be able to see it happen inside. Um, you know, if most of you are here uh, and you have been in the jhanas, uh, if you have been in the levels of infinite space and infinite consciousness, um, there's no way somebody can teach you outside how that part works really. You can just try to describe it, but you have to be able to see it to really understand how it's working. And um, the people, the, they took the skills they need to attain knowledge and vision. And then this turns, this is, forms the foundation stone so that knowledge and wisdom can happen. So that when you do go through and your mind opens up more and more and more, what you're putting together makes perfect sense. The pieces align to go together. Within his system of training, everyone followed the same path, passing through the same levels on the path. The only difference in development time was how well they followed the instructions or they changed them and they had to go and stop and go and stop a lot of times. But if they followed the instructions precisely and they didn't deviate away from the instructions, they didn't try to massage it here, change it here, push it there, pull it here, and then it works. It works. And then you, you, you can say, I can say, don't believe me, go try it if you stick directly to what he was saying the instructions were. But it didn't stop here either. The Buddha wanted us to understand how well we were progressing as we practiced his meditation. And over the years, he created a clear development and progression charts to give us things along the way. He was a teacher of great compassion. And in this way, he was eager to be sure that we comprehended what he found and what they were repeating. The only difference between the monastics and the lay people following the path really is the time uh, that they have and each group has and the discipline that they put into their practice. There's a lot of support when you're in a monastery where there's a lot of people training. There's a lot of support. 
if the group is attempting to actually follow the teacher to check each other and say, I'm seeing you slip, I'm, I'm seeing you slip and sharing that and catching each other and helping each other. There was a lot of that going on. The monastics and the more serious practitioners used the same path to develop. The difference is that they put more time into their practice while living under monastic code, and they spent extended time at monasteries doing temporary ordinations to make more progress also. The people from outside were the next level down. And they might say they decided to go for the gold. <laughs> You know, they were obedient and followed directions very carefully. They spent extended periods of time on certain approaches of study to fully understand. They internalized them, reflected on them, scrutinized them, followed the instructions of study that is given in Sutta number 95, the Chanki Sutta. They internalized what they were learning and they used the, the practice. They would go into isolated areas for practice, reaching deeper states of consciousness. Lay people, but lay people could also use these, uh, reach these states of consciousness, but they had other responsibilities of a householder that tended to pull them out of their meditation before getting to the finer observation levels. This second group's clear pursuit was the goal of liberation and to experience the complete relief of Nibbana with understanding. And they practiced in earnest to naturally raise up their level of compassion for a more peaceful world. So they, the, the, we heard, um, can't tell you which books I found these in, stories of villages where there was absolutely no, no, um, no uh, despair or no fighting of relationships, no um, immoral crimes, no crimes of stealing, nothing. If people didn't have enough to eat, people were feeding them and helping them. Everything was in order and working beautifully in some of the areas where the whole village or town had embraced the practice and was trying to help each other to, to do it within their families. <clears throat> 